for the morning session. Thanks for coming. Um, we have Avi from IS, and he's going to tell us about hidden symmetries and computational problems. All right, let me turn this on. Interesting experience to talk with this uh, whatever shield. Let's see where I can stand. It. See this. Um, okay, so uh, this part of uh, you know two talks uh, after uh, mine, uh, Michael Walter will talk at uh, whatever eleven, um, and uh, this is algebraic part supposedly the algebraic methods part of the workshop. So there will be. Uh, it was mainly analysis and uh, uh, geometry so far, and uh, there will be some algebra, and I'll tell you about <clears throat> connection. But actually, there's plenty of math interconnected in this uh, in this story, and I'll try to uh, uh, describe this project that's been going on for like uh, uh, five or six years with this uh, group of people. Um, uh, as it evolves more or less, because that's the simplest and I think uh, nicest way to tell the story and how we uh, learn about it. So uh, the plan is uh, basically to to tell you about the one problem we want to solve: uh, the singularity of symbolic matrices that I'll define, uh, and one algorithm which you, I'm sure you all know, this alternate minimization algorithm, but applied in this case. And then uh, there'll be these loops that. Uh, Partly you'll see in this talk and then the next where we internalize what happened and generalize uh, both algorithms, problems and tools uh, to get more applications and uh, better algorithms. And uh, at the end, uh, I mean, this is where we are now is uh, we have, a, I think, a pretty good understanding of what this uh, set of techniques and algorithms give. And uh, in particular, this was discussed on the first day. Uh, they give a class of uh, problems for which uh, you can apply geodesic convex optimization uh, and uh, you can analyze it really completely and get the uh, polynomial time bound. So you'll see how these uh, arise and what the algebraic tools that are uh, involved in getting them. Um, so that's, uh, that will be the end of the second talk, I guess. Uh, what I really, you know, sort of uh, love and uh, also amazed by uh, in this uh, project is how it touches so many areas of so many uh, I mean, mathematics, physics, and uh, uh, computer science optimization. So you see here a list that I probably will not go through uh, of various uh, connections and applications. Some of them will come out later. I just want to highlight that this is the, the place I'm coming from. I, through complexity theory, I'm interested in uh, in um, proving lower bounds. I'm interested in uh, de-randomization, and uh, this is how I got to this. So totally inadvertently into uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> and the main tools that you'll see that I want to highlight are coming from invariant theory. So we'll talk about symmetries and uh, these problems mentioned there. Uh, at least I'll give you like a slight crash course on. Uh, this part and you'll see again more on the second and uh, yeah it gives algorithms and uh, i'm not sure how far we'll get but there are these new algorithms that turn out to be able to solve things that are you know sort of surprising partly uh, solving certain families of quadratic uh, uh, systems of equations that in general are, are hard and uh, solving exponentially large linear programs. Uh, these are the moment polytops that you'll see in the second talk. So let me start. Uh, I want to describe the problem and the algorithm. So uh, to describe this algebraic problem, I'll start from a simpler, my baby case problem, which you all know, and so it will be easy. The baby case problem is just bipartite matching. Uh, we have a, a graph, you know, uh this is uh, what uh, you know my kids uh, preferences with candies and the question is whether i can uh, match them up in this particular graph it's impossible uh, sorry it is possible <laughs> and in this one it is impossible so some graphs have a perfect matching some don't and the first algebraic connection is uh, is that uh, we can represent a graph as a matrix so 
Uh, that's obvious. That's uh, uh, yeah. Maybe I should mention that uh, this is a much older problem that at least I knew. Uh, a polynomial time algorithm for this problem is ancient. It's uh, uh, Jacobi already uh, found one because he was interested in some systems of ordinary. Uh, differential equations, he really needed to solve them. I mean, that's why the mathematicians in general discovered algorithms lost because <laughs> a long time before uh, you know, computer science existed. Um, anyway, we can represent a, a graph by a matrix. Let's say the graph G, we have the adjacency matrix of G written there, uh, one for an edge, zero for a non edge. And in this uh, presentation, a uh, way to say, you know whether matching exists or not, or in fact how many matchings exist, is to write down the permanent of the matrix. The permanent of the matrix is just a, like the determinant without the sign. So we basically add up over all diagonals the products of elements in the diagonal. So each diagonal uh, would correspond to a potential matching. That's a very simple formulation. The graph has a perfect matching if and only if the permanent is positive. But uh, as you probably know, and I'll mention again, the permanent, unlike the determinant, is supposedly a very hard to compute function. Uh, so maybe that's not the best formulation of the problem. Um, but uh, Edmond suggested a different uh, formulation, algebraic formulation, that will be you know, our starting point. Uh, you can replace the ones in the adjacency matrix by variables, distinct variables for every entry. Please, by the way, please stop and ask any questions if anything is unclear, right? I mean, I, I know it's a varied, uh, you know, collection of people with varied backgrounds, and uh, if anything is the you know, notation or otherwise is unclear, just stop me. Um, so we, in the adjacency matrix, we put variables. Uh, so we get another matrix. It's now a symbolic matrix, right? A, G of X of these variables X. And now we can rephrase uh, that once did the perfect matching problem. There is a perfect matching if and only if that's this determinant of this symbolic matrix is not identically zero. Okay. This should be obvious why. I mean, this uh, determinant is a polynomial. You can expand it. And uh, the, what uh, non zero monomials will correspond to products of variables along diagonals, general di diagonals of this matrix, so they're long matchings. And the only thing you need to notice is that uh, no determinant, of course, has signs plus and minus, but no monomial can cancel another because all the variables are distinct. Okay, so that's another uh, formulation of perfect matching. It's in P because perfect matching is in P. Uh, but the beauty of, of, the, of Edmond's insight was that he looked at this problem and then suggested a generalization, very natural generalization. Here we are interested in determinants of this type of matrices, but he says, well, let's not put just distinct variables in a matrix. Let's just put an arbitrary linear form in every uh, entry of the matrix. And uh, so, right, so <clears throat> every matrix has such a, how does this work? Yeah, has a linear form in it. So one way to represent such a symbolic matrix is just as is written here, you have a bunch of matrices in the field, A1, A2, up to AM, and you write the uh, sum of AI, XI, when the XIs are variables. So you get such a matrix, and uh, again, symbolic matrix, and you may be interested in, you know, um, you know, so the singularity problem that Edmond suggested was, I give you such a matrix, so I give you this tuple A1 through AM, and ask you whether this determinant is identically zero or not. So that's a problem we'll, we'll care about. We really care about this problem. Uh, and I'll explain why. And uh, now it's not obvious that this is a polynomial time algorithm. It's more general than before, and now things may cancel and so on. So what do we know? He asked whether there is a polynomial time algorithm more than 50 years ago, and we still don't know. Um, it's a nice problem. Why should we care? Well, another, by the way, uh, observation uh, really is, uh, uh, was made yeah, long ago when randomized algorithms became in vogue, uh, is that this is a really easy problem to solve if you allow randomization. And the algorithm is really simple. I mean, it's a symbolic uh, matrix. It cannot expand it because it has exponentially many terms. 
But if you plug random values to the uh, variables, a big enough range, then it's very easy to see that uh, the chance you will hit a, uh, you'll hit a zero. So if, if, if the symbolic determinant is identically zero, whatever you plug in, you'll get zero. But if it's not, the chance you'll uh, land on the zero is negligible. So it's a really good probabilistic algorithm. So we really just care about the randomization, removing the randomness, if we want to put it in P. Um, why, is it, why is this problem so essential? Why is it not just another algebraic problem that maybe doesn't talk to you at all? Uh, for several reasons, Valiant uh, in his theory of algebraic complexity uh, discovered this, uh, that this problem really can captures all algebraic identities. I mean, if you ever wonder why you see so many uh, symbolic determinants all over uh, mathematics, uh, they capture formulas basically, and uh, any algebraic identity you know can be formulated as the question of whether a symbolic determinant is zero. There are plenty of them. Uh, that's one reason. So it's a complete problem in a sense. In fact, it's a complete problem for a class that we define. Uh, there are many special cases that uh, arise in combinatorics and in uh, algebra and so on, which fit into this uh, framework. But the perhaps the most amazing uh, reason for the importance of this problem is the following implication. Suppose we found a deterministic polynomial time algorithm for this problem. Then you see the implications there, uh, something in brackets, P different than MP. And for those who never saw this kind of uh, you know, uh, implication, it's stunning in several ways. So it's, uh, first of all, you know, we have a, uh, have a way of proving, well, what is this uh, brackets around uh, P different than MP? It's just the algebraic version. There's the algebraic classes that Valiant defined, VP and VNP. And uh, separating them is, uh, you know, <laughs> where we stand is just as hard as separating P from NP. And what this statement that Kabanets and Impaliazzo showed about 20 years ago is that if you have an algorithm for one problem, this problem, then you prove a lower bound. You prove that another problem is hard. In fact, the problem you prove hard is the permanent. The permanent is a complete problem for the uh, class VNP for the analog of NP is like an NP complete problem in the algebraic setting. So if you find an algorithm for one problem, you prove that another problem is hard, and in fact, solve the major open problem in complexity theory. So uh, in some talks, I, I mean, as you will see, we are going to get into algorithms for problems like the singularity, which are basically look like gradient descent. So sort of a nice way to remember this is it's quite possible that uh, gradient descent will be useful for proving that P is different than NP. Sort of pretty mind boggling. Uh, any questions about this? I'm not going to, yeah. Yes, I have a couple of questions. The first one is, is there anything to gain by not using linear forms with like higher order polynomials in there? Uh, no, you can uh, reduce the higher order linear forms to, uh, uh, yeah, like uh, polynomials into, uh, uh, into linear forms, uh, it, it, you will pay in the description of the polynomial. So if you have a small algebraic circuits for these polynomials, you can reduce it to that. There's nothing to be gained. Okay. And, and the second question I have is, are there any other examples where the randomization implies that P is not equal to N? No, oh. no, no. This is a sort of a really special problem. Okay. Yeah. Question. Yeah. So, uh, there is a strong evidence that every randomized algorithm can be randomized. Yes. To the point that, that if P is not equal to RP, then there is some exponential time algorithm. So, exactly. this is like a reverse. Yeah. Right? Yes, that's a very good question. So, in Palazzo and I showed uh, that if you have a hard problem like, uh, you know, satisfiability or uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, whatever traveling salesman is exponentially hard, and in fact, you can remove randomization from every from every probabilistic algorithm, and you are right. This is a very good observation that you made. And then it seems like we are done. It's we win either way. Of course, the subtlety is in exactly the assumption of what hard means. Here, uh, okay, in the in the paper with Impaliazzo in this hardness versus randomness uh, result. 
what you need is a circuit law bound. So you need to say that uh, uh, whatever satisfiability or Hamiltonian cycle or whatever, and some NP complete problem is hard for non uniform algorithms for circuits. Circuits can simulate randomness easily. So there is no contradiction here. What you demand is a non uniform assumption in that result. And this is, uh, you want a deterministic uniform polynomial time algorithm for singularity. But uh, yeah, it's a very good, very good point. So, I mean, I still believe <laughs> that one can de randomize this because of that reason, but we, we cannot use it. We cannot plug it in. Uh, and as I mentioned, that's, that's uh, how I came into this, uh, uh, looking at this um, and looking for algorithms for singularity. Uh, okay, so now let's talk about, we are not going to solve this problem because otherwise we'd have that uh, algebraic P is different than algebraic NP. So I want to tell you what we saw. So it turns out that symbolic matrices have a, a dual life. It's the same uh, picture as before. Uh, we are given these matrices and we ask whether the symbolic matrix is singular. Uh, in the case, you know, implicitly, I didn't say it, but uh, we sort of all, you know, think that variables commute in most of our daily lives. And in this case, asking whether it's uh, the determinant zero is the same as asking whether this <clears throat> symbolic matrix is uh, singular matrix of variables well in the field of rational functions over these variables. So that's what it is, and we told you, the status of this um, of a probabilistic algorithm, we don't know a deterministic algorithm. But you can study this, and especially if you are interested in lower bounds, that's really how I, I uh, got into this, uh, trying to understand the non commutative case. Uh, just think of these variables as non commuting, maybe they represent matrices or something. Uh, and you can ask the same question I mean, is a symbolic matrix like this singular? And now to define this, what field you are working on, what is the field of rational functions of non-commutative variables is a complex beast. I'm not going to define it here. We'll see other definitions of the same question later, which are elementary. But anyway, people studied this and uh, it was not even clear. It seems like a much harder problem, this non-commutative analog, it, uh, even just proving that it's decidable, which is trivial in the commutative case. Uh, took a long time. Uh, and the best upper bound that was known was the exponential time, probabilistic or deterministic. So what I mainly want to tell you about is this algorithm with uh, Gar Gurvitz and Oliveira from about five years ago, giving a polynomial time algorithm for this uh, problem and uh, sort of gradient descent type uh, algorithm for this uh, over the rationals or the complex numbers. And uh, soon after it was proved using different algebraic methods to the case of uh, yeah, basically any field. But I'll tell you only about this. Okay, uh, good, these are the problems. So now I'm going to turn to algorithms. If... Okay, so the algorithm we employ for solving uh, uh, this uh, alternate minimization, which We'll see. So let's uh, go back to our baby problem, then perfect matching, and then uh, we'll apply it uh, to this problem and then later to the problem we want to solve. Um, the per perfect matching problem. And uh, there's yet another formulation that's algebraic uh, that captures perfect matching that will be key for us. And this is a scaling problem, matrix scaling problem. Many of you must have seen it. What's the scaling problem? Uh, I give you a non-negative matrix, and I, you know, a doubly stochastic matrix, of course, is a matrix of all sums and column sums are one. And what I ask you is whether a given matrix can be scaled to be doubly stochastic. So what is scaled? What I allow you is to multiply rows and columns by constants. In other words, pre and post multiply by a diagonal matrix. So that's what you are allowed to do. And the question is whether you can make A doubly stochastic by this operation. Uh, let me uh, state it more uh, formally. But the question you are given A and you ask whether there are R and C <clears throat> so that uh, when you pre and post multiply, when you scale, you get row and column sums approximately one. In other words, for any epsilon, you can find R epsilon and C epsilon so that the 
all sums and column sums will be one up to epsilon and you can do this for every epsilon then you can we say we you can scale c this seems like a, you know a you know, fuzzy version to define the scaling problem but it's the right version if you care about perfect matching because you can do this if and only if the permanent is positive if and of the of the matrix a so it's a zero one matrix if and only if it has a perfect matching it's not hard to uh, show and that's a good exercise for you and people looked at this for actually lots of scaling problems for lots of reasons in numerical analysis, signal processing. Uh, then uh, I'll mention it. We looked at it for approximating the permanent. And uh, yeah, it has many motivations and many algorithms and different analysis. And uh, yeah, we'll see one. Okay, so that's, uh, that's how we are going to solve the perfect matching problem. And that's the kind of algorithm we later use to solve the uh, singularity, non-commutative singularity problem. So let's try to do it. So we are given a matrix, maybe it's a matrix of a bipartite graph, and we ask, can this be scaled by row and column uh, operations? It's a sort of a weird question. I mean, if you think about it, uh, in the scaling problem, the parameters sort of match. You are given like two n three uh, things to do, right? The scalars to multiply the rows and columns, and you have two n conditions. Um, and uh, yeah, it looks like a fair game. Of course, there are matrices that cannot be scaled. For example, the zero matrix cannot be scaled. So let's see about this one. How would you try to, what would be an algorithm to scale this matrix? And uh, here comes this, you know, algorithm of Sinkhorn. And actually people discovered this even in the thirties, there are various things sometimes without analysis. Uh, we want to know whether we can scale it. So, uh, and of course the rows and the column conditions conflict. So here's a simple, naive, maybe bold idea. It's just, uh, you know, you want to solve uh, this big problem, let's solve half of it. Let's try to see whether we can scale the rows. Okay, because simultaneously maybe it's hard. So let's just solve it for the rows. Can we scale the rows? Yes, no, yeah, okay. Of course, that's a trivial problem. Okay, so let's try it. So we can scale the rows. Okay, we scale the rows, the columns don't, don't work. Let's scale the columns. Okay, now the rows don't work, so let's scale the rows. And we can continue this, and you will see that it converges to, it doesn't converge, I mean, flip between these two states. So this doesn't convert, this particular algorithm doesn't convert. Maybe it's okay because this graph didn't have a perfect matching, so uh, that's good, maybe. So we better try it with another example. Uh, before, let me just sort of formally state the algorithm. It's just a two-line algorithm, right? It's a, you know, you iterate, uh, scale rows, scale columns, this R of A and C of A are just the obvious way of uh, the scaling coefficients is one over the row sum or one over the column sum. Okay, very simple algorithm. Um, and this is uh, really the alternating minimization heuristic. Um, we'll, we'll generalize it later, but it just, you, you solve part of the problem that's easy when you have uh, you know, many constraints and you just separate them and solve each part separately. Uh, suppose we look at this matrix, which does have a perfect matching, right? The, the anti-diagonal is all ones uh, corresponding to this graph. Um, here I scale the rows. Now I scale the columns. I scale the rows. And those of you with the sharp eyes would see that uh, some of the things in anti-diagonal increase and the things in the off. Uh, upper triangles that shrink, and actually that's what it converges to in this case. So it converges, and this graph does have a perfect matching. So that also looks good. And in fact, it's uh, it's good always. So here's the algorithm, and uh, um, the main. So let me finish with the algorithm. What you do is you run this iteration some polynomial number of times, like n cubed. It's just this stupid naive algorithm, which is greedy. Uh, after this number of steps, you just test, well, one side, let's say the columns add up to precisely one, and the rows are within, you test whether they are within one over n of being one. So this epsilon you take to be one over n, and you just declare 
you know, if it is, then you say the permanent is positive. Otherwise, you say the permanent is zero. That's what you, that's what the algorithm does. So I claim that it works and it works efficiently, as you can see. And there are many analyses, and I want to give you a particular one that uh, we, for completely different reason, uh, did uh, about 20 years ago for reasons of uh, uh, deterministic approximations of the permanent with Linal and Samodnitsky. And it's really simple. And in fact, this analysis will show up again and again. Um, so we are. As we scale rows, scale columns, scale rows, scale columns, we are just creating a sequence of matrices. They are initial A, and then A1, A2, and so on. And like Asia said in the you know the first lecture on Monday, uh, these are you can think of them as discrete dynamical systems. And discrete dynamical systems, how do you analyze convergence? There's uh, practically uh, one way: you find a good progress measure, you find a good uh, or dissipating uh measure and what we did in this uh, paper was to pick the permanent this function itself to be a progress measure if you pick it then things are really simple so there are three steps to every analysis using a you know the open of function progress measure uh, one is a bound and it's very easy to see that uh, the permanent of any of these matrices is at most one because it's either stochastic by rows or stochastic by columns. Permanent is at most the product of row sums or the product of column sums, so it's at most one. So you have a bound. Second thing, you want to show that every step of the algorithm, you know, makes progress in this progress measure. And I claim that uh, <clears throat> this uh, row scaling or column scaling, if, if there is room to grow, it will grow by at least this factor, one plus one over n. Okay, you are, you know that you are still not one over n close uh, because that's what you check in the algorithm here. So uh, it grows, and this proof is one line. It's just arithmetic mean geometric mean inequality. So it's really simple. And the third step is also simple. This is a diameter bound, right? You want to say you always start not too far from the solution. And in this case, uh, you know, if the permanent is positive, which is the case you are interested in, if it's zero, it will remain zero forever. Uh, if it's positive, it's not too small. And all we need is something exponentially small, exponential lower bound, because as you grow multiplicatively, this will take polynomial number of steps. And this again, it's uh, it's really simple. You just scale once, and then you you see that you'll have a diagonal with every entry at least one over n. So you get this lower bound. So it's really really simple, and we'll see how to generalize it and what's needed when we try to generalize it. Question so far. This uh, this is the algorithm we we are going to use. Can you read off a perfect matching from the final matrix? Yes, you can read off a, a perfect matching from. A, uh the result a really interesting question is what do the numbers mean i mean in this case there was a unique perfect match uh it turns out that the surviving so some things will go to zero it's easy to know what they are these are uh, uh the edges that uh, participate in no perfect matching the one there'll be ones uh, maybe if these will be edges that appear in every perfect matching and then there'll be positive numbers between zero and one. Their meaning, I don't know. I wish I knew. It's really, it's really interesting. Uh, okay, so we see this is easy and this will change later. Uh, you know, people don't, we don't learn this in uh, college, this algorithm for perfect matching, even though it's two lines, it's so pretty and so simple to analyze. Much simpler, I think, than the augmented part. Anyway, uh, this thing has analog for non-uniform scaling. Sometimes you are interested in different marginals, so marginal problems are, are very common. You want row sums and column sums to be something else. Uh, it's like max flow. And uh, there are many scaling problems. Also, we'll see quantum scaling problems later. Anyway, I just want to mention that you can uh, do the same exactly for the non-uniform uh, scaling with the same algorithm. Okay, so now I want to move to the real problem, which is this non commutative singularity and operator scaling. Uh, 
And here, uh, just a couple of years after this paper with uh, Lenal Samolnitsky, uh, Gurwitz made uh, what I call a quantum leap, which is at least, uh, at least two minutes. So first I want to say something about quantum generalization of quant classical problems, and this is a cartoon. Um, in general, you go up dimension by one. Uh, so here we, we start with the matrix scaling, we start with the positive matrix in operator scaling, which will be the quantum generalization. You go to a quantum, uh, to a positive operator, I'll explain what it is, but it's a tuple of matrices. You usually go from L1 norm to L2 norm. Uh, it doesn't have to have meaning for you. I'm just uh, drawing this analogy. Uh, you know, diagonal matrices or vectors become matrices that are uh, invertible. Uh, that's how what will be used to scale. There is a notion of what the you know tensor like this, a tuple of matrices, is scaled. It's a very simple analogy of the notion of double stochasticity, which we'll return to. Here and uh, you know you can do it also in the non-uniform case. So there is a very simple analogy, and uh, Gurwitz wanted to use this analogy in order to solve the commutative singularity problem. That's what he was interested in, and here's how he wanted to uh, look at it. So it turns out our original problem was uh, you know this singularity problem. So the input was a tuple of matrices which defined a symbolic matrix. And we were interested in this singularity questions. And he's, he pointed out that the tuple of matrices, a tensor, of course, can represent lots of things. In particular, in quantum information theory, it can represent a positive operator. What's a positive operator, completely positive operator? What defines a general quantum operation or error operation sometimes? It acts, this operator, so again, the tuple of matrices acts on a matrix P simply by this sum, some AI, P, AI transpose or dagger if they're complex. Okay, so that's, this is it. It's a linear operation on the matrix P. And of course, if P is a positive semi-definite matrix, then it remains so. And that's very important in quantum information theory, this uh, matrices P would be density matrices of you know, represented quantum states. That's what they apply them to. Okay, so there's another meaning to a tuple. And uh, as I mentioned, there's a notion of when an operator like this is doubly stochastic, which is a complete analog of uh, you know, what it is in the matrix case. So you have this equation and uh, one, uh, you know, just uh, one way to represent them is that when you apply this operator to the identity, you get the identity. And when you do the transpose, then you get the identity as well. This is like all, all, all sums and column sums. <clears throat> so we can ask whether we can or cannot scale an operator. It's another computational problem. And his insight, Gurwitz's insight was that the operator scaling problem is that uh, this, at least if proved one implication, you know, you cannot scale L implies that L is singular as for commutative variables. And unfortunately, this was only one direction, and this was not the right uh, notion. And what we understood, what started, or one important in, uh, you know, input to this work was that uh, it captures exactly the non-commutative singularity problem. So the scaling question, I give you an operator, can it be scaled? It's equivalent to the non-commutative singularity problem that I told you we'll, we'll solve. Uh, the other insight was that since this is a complete uh, sort of automatic quantum generalization of uh, the problem, maybe a completely automatic quantum generalization of, quant uh, generalization of the algorithm would work. That was uh, his second insight, Gurwitz, and he suggested an algorithm. You want to scale an operator, well, scale the rows, scale the columns. In this case, rows and columns, you just pre-multiply by a non-singular matrix on the left on a singular matrix on the right simultaneously to all the, to all the tuple, the AIs. You don't have to read through it. You just have to glance at this square and realize that it is the same problem. It's an alternate minimization. You solve part, you the rows part, the column part, and you iterate. And at the end, you test whether you are close and you declare it you know, non-singular or singular according to uh, whether you can get close enough or not. You even suggested the progress measure. 
uh, analogous to the permanent in the classical case. This is called the capacity. Again, you don't have to read the formula, but it's simple. It just, uh, it's just not obvious how to compute it, but it's a, a simple formula. It's the infimum of all positive definite matrices of the ratio between the input and output of the, the output and input of the of this operator. The points about choosing this, like with the permanent, is that it composes well with this operation, with the, with the operation. So, in fact, it's, it's pretty easy to prove that it's captured just like with the permanent and perfect matching, it perfectly captures singularity or non singularity. So, you just want to know whether the capacity is positive. And the, the analysis is exactly the same. You know, it's very easy to bound the capacity of, you know, the sequence. Again, you have a discrete dynamical systems. You are generating a sequence of operators by this, uh, you know, uh, scalings. Uh, the same arithmetic mean, geometric mean works. Uh, <clears throat> and you see that you grow if you have room to grow by this operation. And that's where we got stuck uh, in 2004. How to prove this diameter bound? How to prove that when you start, if the capacity is positive, uh, then, uh, you know, it's, a, it's only exponentially smaller, not much smaller. And this is really the key to what's going to happen now, this algebraic uh, part. Uh, and that's really what we proved. And uh, uh, it was, you know, which gives, of course, the polynomial time upper bound, right? If you start exponentially small, this will uh, converge in polynomial time. Is that the input needed in order to prove this uh, is, you know, at least as far as I know, uh, involves algebra and variance theory and notions uh, that I'll, I'll talk about in a second, like degrees of invariant polynomials. So to Philippe's question in the first day to, I think, Nicholas about situations where, uh, you know, why can't you do it? Why do you need geodesic convexity? Why do you need group structure? Can't you bare hands attack this problem? And I see no way of doing anything like this for this problem or problems like this. There's just no way. There's an algebraic theory that will provide you means for proving such a diameter bound. And I don't see any other, uh, you know, bare hands or, you know, sheer, sheer brute force that would get you such a bound, even a finite bound, a, a concrete finite bound. I don't know. Um, so we have this algorithm, it's polynomial time, and uh, actually it solves not just this problem, but lots of problems. So I mentioned it already in the beginning, but, and I, you already saw, saw two problems which are described, their input is just a tuple of matrices, right? Uh, uh, singularity problem and the positive operator scaling problem. And in fact, I listed here six different problems, and they all are problems given uh, the, the input is a tuple of, uh, matrices and there are problems in, in very different domains and they are all equivalent. I mean, the first five are equivalent. The last is, is actually a special case of the rest. And for those of you who remember Suvrit's talk, uh, uh, he mentioned our work on, um, on the bus complete inequalities, these inequalities with generalized uh, Helder and uh, you know, Young and all these uh, other inequalities computing the, the optimal constant in these uh, inequalities uh, is also part of this. So they are all the same and they all, you know, inherit this polynomial time algorithm. Okay, so uh, that's a consequence of this algorithm. It turns out that there are by now more, more is known, more problems are known that are solved by this method. Um, but, okay, let me ask if there are questions and then I want to say something about the uh, you know, invariant theory and how it enters this uh, analysis of this uh, of this algorithm. So, questions so far? Yeah. You mentioned the complexity in the relevance to the determinant versus permanent. Yeah. So, yes. So, the problem we are trying to solve uh, is the determinist part. So, what is solved here is the non-commutative version of the determinant problem of the singularity problem. This is not the problem, this is not the result that will imply that permanent is different than determinant. 
what we want, what we are asking ourselves continuously, and there's uh, much more work that I will not be able to talk about, is to see whether algorithms of the same type might be used for the commutative singularity problem, and uh, you know, then we'll be home. But what, what is limiting them? That's uh, the, for me, that's a major motivation. So, so far, it, you know, this result doesn't resolve this question, but the motivation is in it's separating permanent from the terminal. It also connects, maybe I should use this, uh, your question to mention, uh, one of the main approaches to uh, uh, separating the terminant and permanent, separating VP from VMP, is uh, what's called the GCT, geometric complexity theory uh, of Malmari and Sohoni. And it's an algebraic geometric uh, approach, but it uh, merges very well with a kind of, uh, you know, both uh, uh, algorithms and hardness results as well, or barrier results that uh, you know, uh, we derive. So there's a confluence of these very seemingly, seemingly different uh, uh, approaches to the permanent versus determinant form. Don't tell you like a you know, five minutes crash course. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Just a quick question. I think you mentioned this algorithm is kind of like gradient descent like. Yeah. Uh, uh, could you briefly comment on like why? I will comment in, uh, nice, yeah, yeah well, I can say it now. I mean, alternate minimization sometimes is called the fixed step gradient descent. What you do uh, in, uh, in gradient descent is you uh, go in the direction of the gradient in some steps that, uh, where you cleverly pick the, the side. Uh, in the alternate minimization, and I'll say the general framework in a couple of slides, you are basically going along certain gradients that you prefer. So locally things easy, you go there and you go as much as you can because you don't lose by that. So you can think of it as a variant of gradient descent. That's why it is. And you'll see more in the second talk. I'll tell you something about invariant theory. I don't know how many of you uh, know about this it's, a, you know, it's an amazing field uh, uh, it is a study of symmetries which is just group actions on objects and their orbits and their invariants and let me give you a couple of examples so you all know this graph isomorphism problem that's a, an obvious problem of uh, you know you're trying to understand uh, you know how the symmetric group acts on the vertices what happens to the graph um, yeah, you've all seen this, uh, you know, uh, billiard table, you push the your white ball and then you let the system evolve. Here, the, you know, the group acting is time. It's just, uh, which is reversible here if collisions are elastic. So just like below, it, uh, the, in all of cases, some group is moving a set of objects. And uh, here you can take two shapes in the plane and just cut them with scissors, let's say along straight lines and rearrange them. So there's some group uh, acting and uh, you have all these situations and what you're trying to understand, despite the fact that there's um, some underlying dynamics, I mean, this group can change the objects around. What doesn't change? These are the invariants. So you want to understand how things move, they move along orbits and what are the invariants, the things that don't change. The quantities that don't change when you are uh, applying uh, group operations to these objects. So the last example, I think it's obvious that the area, I mean, say you don't overlap the pieces you cut, then the area is preserved. And it's a non-trivial, uh, an interesting uh, fact that, uh, you know, the area is the only environment. So any two shapes, you know, within our sites uh, can be moved from one to the other using uh, these operations in three dimensions volume is not the only invariant. Uh, here well you learn in physics what are the invariants uh, energy and momentum and they are the only ones <clears throat> in the case of graph isomorphism we, we are far from understanding the invariants here uh, the kind of groups we are going to look at here are linear groups groups of matrices acting on vector spaces and uh, these stars mean that there are you know, various uh, qualifications you need to put in that I will not go into, simplicity. And 
it's really interesting how this theory has a, you know, both an algebraic part and a geometric part. I'll talk just about the algebraic part and then uh, Michael will talk about the geometric part. So this is a polynomial invariance that I'll show you and you'll see this non commutative duality later. Uh, here are some basic objects of invariant theory that I want to highlight. That's the one slide I have on this. So in a case of linear group, a group of matrices acting on a vector space just by matrix multiplication. And uh, so we can think of the coordinates as variables. So we have polynomials on this space and an orbit is just what the group does to such a such a vector, okay? So it's just all the vectors you can reach by applying the elements from the uh, matrix group you, you have. And since we will work over algebraically closed field, we'll look at the orbit closure. So one important object is the invariant ring. Invariant, those objects that don't change, the quantities that don't change, and they're always polynomials in this case. So they're all polynomials that do not change when you apply the any group element. So I'll give you examples. If the our group is a symmetric uh, symmetric group acting on vectors just permuting coordinates, then well, I'm sure you know what are the invariant polynomials. They are the symmetric polynomials. All polynomials which are symmetric are not going to change if you permute coordinates. And if it is, uh, you take, if here the space is a space of matrices you are acting on, let's say by left and right matrices, that's closer to what we are doing. Uh, anybody knows, want to say what is the preserved quantity? Let's say the, these matrices are of determinant one. What, quant what quantity of the matrix that you act on doesn't change? Determinant, yeah. It's just determinant, so it's generated by the determinant. You should notice that in both cases, these polynomials, so both the, all symmetric polynomials are generated by the elementary one. So we have just degree n polynomials generated the whole ring of invariants. And also here it's of degree n. So are we lucky? Um, what is the degree bound? I mean, can you describe the generators finitely? This was not obvious. Hilbert proved this. That's uh, one of the most important papers in, uh, uh, in the history of algebra. And uh, he proved that there's always a finite generating set of all invariant polynomials. And it is in this paper where he proved the null solid theorem and he proved the finite basis theorem, all these things that are you know, cornerstone of commutative algebra, uh, just to prove this result. This was, well, he of course found many other applications, but he wanted to get this. Uh, and you can and should ask the question, what, is the, what are the degree bounds for this, uh, you know, uh, and it's very important for us. <clears throat> uh, the last object I want to mention is, let's see how much, uh, okay, so I have 10 minutes or eight minutes, um, <clears throat> right, uh, Philip? Or a couple, yeah. Uh, the last object I want to define for a, you know, some such group action is the null cone. Uh, what's the null cone? So we have orbits of this group. You take a vector and you move it to everywhere you can. That's the orbit, and you look at the orbit closure. Uh, the null cone are all points that the orbit closure contains zero. So in some sense, the group makes them similar to the to the origin to zero. They are sort of the, the trivial elements in the vector space according to this group action. Okay. Uh, in this definition, uh, the algebraic definition says it's simply all the vectors in your space that when you apply an invariant polynomial to them, you get zero. Okay. They are nullified by all invariant polynomials, and it is a uh, that's an algebraic variety, and that's important. Uh, and uh, Hilbert and Mumford prove this analytic uh, equivalence that uh, I just mentioned that another characterization of this null cone is that it's all points which are which look like zero. So you can push them as close to zero as you want. And you should remember the definition of matrix scaling when you are pushing the uh, matrix by a group to make it look like, uh, uh, to make it uh, scaled, which is the analog 
maybe it's not obvious analysis. And making it close to zero is the same as you start seeing an optimization problem here, as trying to see whether some group elements can take the norm of this vector to zero. That's the same. So we have an optimization problem. And this is what we are going to generalize in a second. This is what we saw special cases. And this connection between analysis and algebra arbitrary, yeah, just uh, cannot stress how important it is. Uh, the null codes in these examples, in the case of any final group, it's just the zero. Uh, the zero vector is the only vector you can make zero by permutation. And here, you know, uh, the null cone turns out to be the singular matrices, just matrices that the determinant is zero. And in general, lots of things you learned in algebra are null cones of you know, natural groups. The important uh, groups are the null cone of conjugation, and you know, there are many other such. So often you never mention any group action. You define these things uh, without mentioning groups and certainly not null cones, but they arise very naturally from this point of view. So Nalcon membership, so it looks technical and you know who cares? It turns out, and uh, you've seen two examples already, that Nalcon membership, namely given a vector, is it in the Nalcon of the group action, is a natural problem you are familiar with. M m perfect matching is one. And uh, this uh, non-commutative, uh, the operator scaling is one, and many others I'll mention in a second. Ah, moreover, this question is sort of dual. Michael will show that to the scaling problems we discussed. So it's captured lots of problems. Just very so in many problems you don't hear about symmetry, even when you learn in physics that momentum and uh, you know energy are uh, invariant. You don't learn, you don't mention <coughs> you know, uh, invariant theory. So let me talk about this uh, uh, generalization last five minutes. Uh, so we saw this. Uh, we saw these two problems: matrix scaling and operator scaling. And I just stress again: we saw that both were solved with alternate minimization algorithms. Now we see that in both cases, now we, we think of these matrices that you apply on both sides, diagonal or invertible. They are groups, right? So the group actions, and in fact, you know, the algorithm moves along an orbit of of this uh, group. Uh, the analysis, we'll get into this in a second, uh, was a clever potential function, which was different in different cases. And uh, we were solving a scaling problem. But everything, and that's the uh, you know, ma main take home, everything, the algorithm naturally lives in an orbit of a group action. So how would you generalize this? A very simple natural generalization. Uh, you look at all alternate minimization problems and you see when Will such an approach work? So I just want to mention to the question that was asked before. Uh, this is one of the most common heuristics in, uh, in machine learning, in statistics, and so on. Uh, you have a, a complex problem. Maybe it's optimization or sampling problem defined by some function or maybe many variables. And somehow you are lucky. And if you fix all but one variable, it becomes easy. And so a natural heuristic is to solve these uh, local ones. Like uh, you know, if you do something using Monte Carlo, uh, you know, the, this uh, um, Gobner, uh, sorry, uh, global dynamics, uh, what you do, like color, randomly coloring a graph, you keep recoloring one vertex, fixing everything else, uh, and just iterating. So these are all uh, of this nature. They're all alternate min minimization. We just in most cases, we don't know convergence. Certainly, we don't know uh, uh, efficient convergence. But in the case we consider, which is a group theoretic framework, is uh, you know it works. So what generalizes what we've seen before? We have a product of groups acting on a tensor. So you now apply linear actions in each one of the dimensions, and uh, you ask the scaling problem, and there is a natural way to define. What uh, when a tensor is scaled, you basically want the marginals to be uniform, and the general result here is that you have, uh, you know, you have what we had before in bigger generality. You can get epsilon scale, epsilon close to being scaled in polynomial time in all parameters. So let me 
write it again, but I want to stress this sort of, you know, why does this greedy thing works? It's a non-convex problem. I mean, even the domain is non-convex, right? The domain is just these groups. So here it is again. I want to say that again, uh, uh, this scaling problem, which is really dual to testing Nalcon membership is applicable in many uh, other problems that I didn't discuss and let me not discuss them. And uh, we have this, uh, this result that uh, convergence, efficient convergence. I want to stress that polynomial time in one over epsilon is not enough, like in the classical Euclidean case. Sometimes you want what you call, I guess, quadratic convergence, and I like to call exponential convergence. So you want log one over epsilon there, and Michael will talk about this. And I want to stress that the same analysis works. So you have this, you know, Lyapunov function, and the Lyapunov function turns out that we didn't have to be so clever in the previous algorithm. The L2 norm is a good enough progress measure. When you apply it, and, and this comes from the non commutative duality, uh, you know, there are two easy parts the bounding, uh, uh, the upper bound, and the growth, again, AMGM works like magic. And this diameter bound uh, becomes harder. I mean, you just need to, to use, you know, more complicated, uh, basically more complicated uh, um, invariant theory and representation theory in order to understand this. Um, so basic questions, I'm, you know, I have one more slide besides this. Uh, ask at this point is you know why does it work i mean we are in a non-convex situation uh we have a greedy procedure and converges and uh, you know it's, uh, always converges to the optimum so you smell the geodesic complexity here and you see it in michael's talk uh what's connects is scaling and nalcon problems i mentioned this and you'll see non-commutative duality in the next talk and you know all this works if we have you know, capacity to do alternate minimization. We have, you know, something to alternate. What do you do if you just have some group action? It doesn't have this group structure. And Michael will talk about this. We can handle this again uh, using geodesic convexity. So let's move to the summary slide. Yeah. What is little vi in the, in the matrix? It's like, it's a dynamical system. You start from a vector v and you start applying the algorithm, generating V1, V2, V3, like we generated matrices by- uh, So for, for, for Syncorn, VI is the, is the current matrix? It's the current matrix, yes. And, and, and for operator scaling okay. is the current, yeah. You, you say if you look at its Frobenius norm, it's enough as a- Yes, a yes, yeah, yeah. It is for, for matrices, it would be the one norm, because there's some translation. Yeah, so you can, in the matrices will be the one norm, but you can represent the matrix scaling problem initially as a, as a L2 norm, you know, you want to uh, make the L2 rather than L1 norm of the rows and codes one, and then you can use L2. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's in fact, think of the original uh, proof, use, use L2, but he could prove it only for a, a matrix with full support, like all the entries were positive. So just to clarify, what you're looking at is the distance to the marginal, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, but you, really, you look at the distance to the marginal, but if you look at the Nalcon definition, what you are really looking is how close to zero can you make your... So you have to subtract off something, which is really the marginals, and then you are trying to push the matrix to zero. Okay, but, but for Syncorn, I mean, it's pretty well known that the right measure is the key on where you are. It's not that, what do you mean the right measure? There are many measures which oh, will work. Many that work. Yeah, but the, I mean, when you, you you're doing alternate projection, right? So you're actually yeah. in KL. So yeah. you're actually really in yeah. KL, KL. Yeah, yeah. But, so, but, so here, when you say we use this two norm, you, that was a choice, right? That was not. It was a choice. The okay. good thing about it is that this is a universal choice. Forget the now matrix scaling. Do other problems. Of okay. course, you can say I'm doing projection and okay, try to do it in K diversion. And in fact, you are right. That in some cases it even gives better analysis. So in some of our papers we do use uh, KL divergent type measures instead of L2 norm. This will affect quantitative bounds, but it doesn't affect the you know like if you want polynomial time, it doesn't. Yeah, well, it's a good point. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, so let me skip to the. I was going to give the analysis of this to see what the algebra I could see, but I don't have time. You can ask me about it. Okay, so just to mention what you'll see next, you'll see the non commutative duality, you'll see the moment map, which extends the gradient, you'll see geodesic convexity coming, and uh, you'll see actually both first order, second order algorithms. So also algorithms achieving uh, log one over epsilon convergence and uh, some of the analysis tools. And hopefully he'll get to moment polytops. I hope he will. Uh, okay, so just summarizing, I mean, there, I mentioned it not in too much detail. There are lots of interaction with math that uh, uh, come in. It's sort of, in fact, fascinating how many areas of math are uh, interacting there. The problem I described to you, the singularity problem is an algebraic problem. And nevertheless, the algorithm that works was sort of analytic. And on the other hand, this analytic algorithm, this uh, sort of uh, dynamic algorithm, the analysis of it, or you know, was sort of continuous algorithm. The analysis of this and other algorithms are based on, on algebraic tools. So it's sort of tool, uh, cool. And uh, finally, you know, symmetry is, uh, is you know, it, uh, exist in lots of places that uh, maybe you don't expect them or you don't naturally think about them. And if you have it, it's very powerful. Um, yeah, so, well, these are good questions to ask uh, at the end of the other talk, but uh, let me just mention that, uh, yeah, the problem I really care about is this commutative singularity and, you know, solving, having a deterministic polynomial time for it uh, will be amazing. Okay, thanks. Questions? It's at some point uh, you suggested that we should think about all these alternate minimization problems from some algebraic perspective, but the examples that you gave, you sort of had like a closed form solution that would give you what the group action is once you actually carry this out. Did you encounter some examples where there was no closed form solution? Of course, the yeah, this is where you could just like uh, absolutely guess there was a group action in the background. Yes, no, no. So you, there are two questions you are asking. <clears throat> uh, in all the examples I gave, the uh, it was begged that you will have uh, that you use uh, alternate minimization because there is a closed form solution for every local thing, like in sampling uh, Markov. The cases where you don't, the natural cases where you don't, and there are many, and Michael will uh, discuss, are those where there's no product structure to the group. The group is just some group of matrices. I mean, it's not that we can handle all of them, but the framework fits all of them. There, it's not clear what to do. And instead of, you know, you, since you don't have a cross form solution, what you do instead, you say, ah, I have a function. It will turn out to be geodesically convex. And you, you apply the gradient descent or second order method to it. That's what you do. You don't, you will not have a closed form solution. You do what you do in normal convex optimization. It will be a non convex setting, but if you look at it from the right lens, it will be geodesically convex. So the intuition will be the same. The local maximum, local maximum minimum are global ones. So you just start pushing yourself towards the uh, you know, you can, there is a natural sense of making progress without having any cross form solution to a sub form. And, and, and algebra still enters the picture from this? Of course, picture? yes, because the group, what is key, you know, you have to understand the group action. To understand the group action, you have to understand the irreducible presentations of the group. You have to understand some geometric quantities that are you know implicit in the description of this uh, irreducible double presentation then they control when i when you say i mean also in the classical case you say i have a linear or quadratic convergence it always depends on something on the smoothness of your function right some bounds or the lipschitz uh, continuity or other or strong con convexity so you know quantities like that what is the analog in the in this very general framework the analog are the quantities that come out of the geometric representation of the of the of the irreducible representation. 
I, I am not going to define them, but they come up. They, uh, you know, they relate to smoothness in the way you think. They capture the smoothness of this group action. And this will control the converter. So in some cases, I mean, these set of algorithms have exponential improvement on lots of other existing algorithms, but in some of these improvements, they just improve exponentially from a double exponential algorithm. So the still, you know, it still doesn't get to polynomial time. It just, uh, you know, it turns out that this uh, analytic type algorithms or gradient descent type algorithms are much better than, you know, what's classically been used with typically globular basis algorithms. Yeah, so I realize that, you know, all these examples are, uh, you know, not machine learning type application. There are some things that come up that are combinatorial optimization, like, I mean, matching, I mentioned, like intersection of two matroids can be done this way, but uh, I don't know, I don't have others. I mean, uh, I'm sure there are. I mean, there are some applications to learning matrix and tensor uh, Gaussian models that is recent. And uh, yeah, anyway, there are some, a few others, but I don't, you know, I, I think that there's huge room of uh, understanding what it can be applied to for problems that uh, you know, are out there. I'm sure that uh, symmetries exist in many of them and uh, yeah, can be useful. Yeah. The implication that no, but it's a very good question, and uh, it's almost an equivalent. So it turns out <clears throat> that if permanent is indeed exponentially harder than determinant for arithmetic circuits, then in the same paper in Pagliazzo and Cabanet show that it gives you a de-randomization of this, you know, this uh, symbolic determinant problem. So it's almost an equivalent. I didn't. Then that I just told you, so the reverse is pure. The result here, or the result you made, which I mentioned at the beginning, I cheated a little bit. It, seemed, it turns out that if you have a determinist polynomial time algorithm for this uh, singularity problem, you either separate the terminant from permanent or you prove some circuit law bound in the Boolean case. So you, 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 know, you prove something amazing either way, but you don't know which. All right, uh, I guess that's it. We'll check out.